So I also like uh, recording the things. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. For those who, who, who arrived, maybe there will other people will come uh, after they will hear me talking and things like that. Um, this is a session about distributed caching, so less time to check if you're in the right room. Um, but uh, I can tell uh, there's more dedicated people are here. So uh, my name is Viktor Gemov. I work as a senior solutions architect of a company called Hazelcast. I also develop or advocate in this company. And um, I also Twitter junkie. I like Twitter. So you can follow me on Twitter. I'm a very interesting person. So and uh, without further ado, let's go straight to the plan. All right. Another thing that I also, um, on the conferences, I'm building very scalable Hello World applications. So, and kudos to um, Kenny, uh, inventing this title for everyone who on the stage and talking about the things. Um, so yeah, why cache, right? So um, why you want to cache and um, what to cache, what, how it's good or bad. You can see it, you can see it, come on in. All right, so let's start with why, right? So let's start with the problem statement. So what kind of problems do we have? So typical enterprise application contains multiple layers. It contains uh, uh, different layers starting from uh, UI, business logic, the data access layer, some of the middleware, and integration with other systems, uh, messaging system, et cetera. So on these many layers, we're increasing, um, increasing latency of the application. So from, from one level of abstraction to another, the application might uh, slow down. You Usually, so then certain things need to be taken care of um, while optimizing things um, and how to deal with the slowness, etc. So this is like a typical uh, typical business application that interacts with um, with some of the external services, databases, NoSQL, REST services, and at some point you can tweak, you can you can tune, um, and you can um, um, do whatever you can. Uh, for example, optimize the fast access to your database. Um, you can uh, change your network so the access to the database will be faster. Or if you're dealing with some external service, um, you can switch to different provider of the data. However, you tried everything, and um, you tried everything, and it looks like you cannot do anything more. So what you need to do? Another problem in this kind of architecture might came from the perspective that sometimes application is not just a one instance application. Even though we're talking about microservice, it doesn't mean the microservice needs to, uh, doesn't need to be scalable. So, so in case of we have another instance, so this data may be that stores inside inside the application that might need to be available on multiple um, on the multiple layers or a multiple instances of the same application. So how are we gonna deal with this? So my proposal, yeah, let's cache everything. And in this case, cache uh, will be here in between that allows the application um, to, first of all, uh, scale out if it's distributed cache. I'm gonna talk about distributed caching today. And uh, to provide this uh, pattern called read, write, uh, and read through cache and write through cache, meaning that you go into the cache and cache will check if data is there, it's not there, it will fetch it for you. If it's, uh, if it's there, it will just simply retrieve it. All right, so and basically cache is everywhere. Um, and as we know, you can, we can call any um, storage that has like a key value access pattern, it can be it cache. It needs to be simple, simple accessing, simple access path. So the cache is the, uh, it's basically a copy of the data. And the, the, the beauty of this, the access to this copy of the data happens very quickly, uh, or supposed to happen very quickly. Even we um, have some data in database, we can cache it locally in some, some sort of hash map or some sort of map and uh, retrieve it from, from local memory. It would be much faster. So um, even we're dealing with uh, accessing with database where, for example, relational database, we have situation with our data is in a relational form, third normal form, multiple tables. Usually when we're accessing for the cache or some of the um, key value storage, it's normalized, denormalized version. So um, in other, in other, from another terms, from terms of uh, uh, microservices, even, uh, um, event sourcing, it's just another representation or it's another read model in terms of ICQRS. Uh, so 
Obviously, um, if we're talking about CQRS, we can also say cache can be event source. And uh, sorry, I just couldn't resist to put this because it's, I, I, I'm running out of the good options, so I'm coming out with some bad option. But there are some things to, to consider. So um, basically, why people using caches? Uh, to improve application performance, um, like I already said, multiple layers of application accessing to data, um, accessing to multiple things um, from multiple layers of application that will increase uh, total, total latency of multiple components. Um, some of the expensive operations can be offloaded. For example, you're dealing with some of the computation over and over again for same key or for same customer. So why don't you cache this data? Because it's not going to change for 24 hours or for like a work work hours or stuff like that. So some of the data can be uh, can be cached easily. So um, another option. So. Uh, even though the application itself might running on some of the hardware uh, that um, has very powerful capabilities, usual applications do not try to use all these capabilities, and uh, some of the solutions, uh, caching solutions, especially in process caches, um, allow you to do um, kind of like a scale out. You can basically increase capacity of the application by bringing more hardware like this. So you have uh, the, the small guy, Professor Banner, who grows into this uh, this hull guy, but essentially it's the same application, same 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 um, same application, just increasing capacity of this of this hardware. Some of the distributed uh, caches examples allow you to um, scale scale out the uh, if you'd like uh, different components of your system that uh, different pieces or different. Um, instances uh, might interact and they will create shared memory. So basically this thing allows to form a cluster with commodity, uh, commodity machines that will form some, sh some sort of shared memory where the different components can interact through this. And uh, as already mentioned multiple times, key value pattern, very simple, simple, uh, simple to implement, simple to access, simple to use. All right. However, if we're returning to this uh, scale up, um, scale up point, so you can actually scale one machine to one until like one particular point when you um, can uh, grow the hardware. However, it's not always the case. So sometimes um, you need to bring. Um, you, you don't have you have so much data that it's not uh, practically uh, to store it in one place. Or data may be very important that um, you store it in one computer or store it on one node, but you actually have need to have like full tolerance, resiliency, etc. So in this case, it may be not uh, not a good choice to store it in one place. So let's talk a little bit about the data distribution. So how the typical uh, data distribution happens in uh, distributed cache and um, so, how many of you can uh, tell me what you see on this picture in terms of, uh, in terms of data distribution? So, I, in this picture I have a two patterns of data distribution. How many patterns of data distribution you, you might know? Okay, I will explain. In this picture I have uh, two data sets, absolutely identical data sets. And on the second part I have data set that represents in a different form. It's like a sliced. Data set. Anyone? Any ideas? Okay, so it is a replication, right? So we have the same data that copied in multiple nodes. Uh, so, and what's the, not the opposite, but another uh, very useful pattern that people use for data distribution? Partitioning or sharding, correct. But this picture may be not very good uh, from a uh, perspective of explaining how the data will, you know, return to the same form. But in general, yeah, so we have uh, two data sets. Let me put this another way. This is things that most developers would understand, you know, squares um, and arrows. It's much, much easier to understand. So basically, we have a replicated data set which contains copies of the data on the both nodes, and we have a partitioned or sharded data set where whole data set that the, uh, the, the, the developer uh, working with, this data set will be sharded across multiple nodes. 
right? But in practice, in practice, um, usually these two patterns are not used in a in a pure sense. They complement each other. Usually, used um, the pattern called consistent hashing that allows to, uh, based on the key, uh, find the way where this um, value will be stored, and also for providing some of the uh, fault tolerance capabilities, data will be replicated to another node. So, um, but in general, this is what the patterns. So let's talk about, like we're talking about some of the practical things, some of the theoretical things, now let's talk some practical things. So first of all, Hazelcast is the, um, the thing that um, provides you capabilities for building distributed caches, right? So it's in memory, um, meaning that data stored in operational uh, member of the system, it's not stored on the disk, um, it's stored in memory, access pattern very quick. And, um, it's a patch with license. Uh, it provides many uh, different APIs, and today we're gonna focus on some of the caching capabilities, but I will also touch base on some other features like um, messaging or maybe computing, but if you'd like. So, and how it's related to, to Cloud Foundry. So, um, so in memory data grid or the in memory, any type of in-memory system is very, from my perspective, is very good candidate for any sorts of uh, uh, containerization or any sorts of um, um, abilities to run on the cloud. Because uh, basically it's in-memory, it's ephemeral, doesn't require any storage, it requires a fast network, it requires clustered storage, so you can have a date on one node that can be also stored some of the backups on another nodes. So the clustered environment is very good fit for, um, for a memory system like Hazelcast. And um, today we're gonna be using um, Hazelcast that deployed in the Pivotal Cloud Foundry um, that uh, uses uh, Hazelcast tile that was developed for uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So, uh, the uh, tile itself allows to start uh, individual node of Hazelcast cluster on um, on individual VM. So um, in this demo, I'm running this uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry in uh, Amazon Web Services. I use Amazon to provision my um, my cluster. So uh, multiple availability zones supported out of the box in the tile. Um, the Bosch uses uh, used to um, to support a, a high availability of these particular nodes. Plus, um, uh, it interacts with uh, on-demand uh, broker. So it doesn't require any pre-provisioning of the nodes to deploy this. So everything would be uh, taken care of by, by Tile itself. So um, by itself, Hazelcast is written in Java, um, but uh, we have many bindings for different languages, and today we're gonna talk about Node.js particular thing. So uh, I guess we already said about slides, so let's talk about some of the demo, right? Um, so what's the, what's the premise of this demo? Um, how many of you guys here are Node.js developers? Okay, okay, some of you, interesting, because I expected more, more hands um, in there. Okay. So um, in, this, in this example, I'm gonna be using Express. Uh, for those of you who don't know Node.js, Express is very powerful and uh, a very famous or very popular framework for Node.js running web applications. And I'm writing the web application that will, um, microservice, you can say it microservice, that will interact with um, some external system. This is inter external system, um, in this particular case, it's gonna be a GitHub. So in my microservice, I want to use some of the information that GitHub provides about organizations. So I will query GitHub API, and I will um, store this, uh, this result internally. So the way how it works, I will just issue a uh, HTTP request for this URL based on particular organization that I will retrieve from my application parameter and after that I will uh, store it in the cache. Also, Express allows me to, in Express they call it like middleware, so I have this special type of uh, middleware that's called cache, so it, before um, it will retrieve a result and return it to user for me, uh, it actually will check it with the cache, if it's, if it's cached. Um, if it's cached, so it will just return it. If it's not cached, 
it will retrieve it from same uh, same 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 um, uh, GitHub API. So let's let's show let me show you how it looks like. So as you can see from the top right now, I'm running this in. Um, um, just uh, how we can get, make it bigger. Can I make it bigger? Okay. Yep. So I'm running this in um, in uh, in a a a Amazon as a as a as a uh, um, cloud foundry. And the, what you see right now on the screen is uh, this management center console that allows me to see the status of the cluster. So what I see right now that I provisioned a cluster of uh, three nodes, and um, right now I don't have any data here. Right. So another thing that I have is my application that deployed uh, deployed on this. Now this API, you can actually go there and, and uh, play around a bit, but not too much. We have a, let's see if it actually works. Uh, uh, yeah, so there's some, some things that uh, you can see on the main screen. So uh, basically, it runs a um, typical Node.js, uh, the build pack. Um, it interacts with um, different components of the system interact via uh, VCAP uh, services environment variable. So when I start, uh, when I start my uh, my cluster, it actually publishes some of the information about cluster. So in this particular case, it uh, publishes information about members, like uh, IP addresses. So my client, in this case, my Node.js app, um, will uh, will will query this from VCAP services and uh, parse it and provide this configuration parameter for my, uh, for my application. Now, so let's, let's see what this application actually can do. So there's a, there are uh, two, uh, three endpoints. One endpoint will allow me to get some basic stats. So for example, if I go to here and do something like this, um, it will actually will query GitHub information about this particular um, about this particular uh, repository. Also, I can do something like this. Uh, I can do Hazelcast. Hazelcast also on the GitHub. Um, it retrieves repository, and I see response time is a half. Uh, if you if you can see here, it's around um, roughly like half a second, right? So when the next time we'll hit this. This result will be retrieved from, from the cache. So my application will interact with the cache server and get this information uh, back. So if I will switch back to this and I will show you Management Center console. Now in Management Center, what I will see, there is uh, my org map that will store the information about Hazelcast and Cloud Foundry organizations on GitHub. So if I'll go here, I'll see Hazelcast. Um, and I would say I will retrieve, oops. And I will retrieve something from here. Um, no values. So, oh, yep, I, of course. Live demos, always typos. So 61 repositories, uh, the store, the key, it's an organization name, value is a number of repositories. Now, interesting thing here is that also I'm storing the information about repositories itself and I cache them in the data structure called multi-map. So multi-map data structure allows you to store multiple values uh, by the same key. So in this case, uh, key is gonna be organization, number of repositories it would be number of values. And I also can expose this information through, through the REST service. Um, so if I will do, where's my, Oops, uh, I will go here and I will see the information that already cached. So um, the retrieval time is extremely fast because it, it retrieves it from, uh, from, from the cache. And more important that um, if I will do something like this once again, this time, let me actually show you um, CF logs. Um, hopefully I will be able to, yep, connect it. So the hash hit time is ridiculously, ridiculously small. So the reason for that is that, uh, where is it? 
So let me show you some of the interesting pieces. So now my application interacts with the cache. It's all good. But if data was already, uh, um, my application already used this application, so uh, we've already used this data. So in this case, I also can uh, leverage thing called near cache. So I can basically, on the side of my Node.js application, I also uh, store this result, so I don't need to go to the cache server and retrieve it once again. So up to this point, my, the information about organizations will be, will be stored in the near cache of my application. So once again, these, um, I start my application, it established connection to my cluster, it start listening to the port um, that, uh, by the way, um, needs to be uh, retrieved this way because the environment variable, this process end port, will be passed by uh, Cloud Foundry here. Uh, the, and if it will not be there, it's just using this one. This is this suitable for, for local development. Now, some of the interesting things um, that that you can see here also. Um, from perspective of API, uh, capabilities that uh, can be done, interesting thing here is, uh, where is it? It's a thing called the map listener. So basically, each and every time when I will interact with my data, I register a handler uh, some particular callback, uh, the function that will be invoked when something ch happened to my data. So in this case, I can also build more like reactive application when some, some component of the system, the put data into cache, I can react on this. In this particular case, I just simply uh, write this information into, um, into the console, but in this case, I can do something useful. And if I just need to have notification that something's changed, I can include value. So in this case, my, when I assign my um, entry listener, I'm saying here true. So in this case, value will be actually propagated inside here. And if I uh, don't need this, when I just need to use it for notification wise, so in this case, I just uh, can put it this false. Now, um, again, let me show you differences if I would be running this uh, without cache. So there is a um, the special type of uh, URL where I can bypass caching. So in this case, um, you will see the difference. So if I'll go here, um, so once again, so querying Hazelcast, 99 milliseconds. If I do bypass, um, it has a like a half a second. So the difference, you, uh, probably you you probably can see. And if it's it's numbers going to be uh, even bigger for. Um, for Cloud Foundry because um, Cloud Foundry, uh, Cloud, uh, Cloud Foundry repository uh, is enormous or organization in GitHub is enormous. Um, it's 100, but I think it's just a li limit of the GitHub uh, that uh, limits of number um, repositories per page. Um, so if I do bypass, so it takes even even longer, so to retrieve this information. So the caching uh, can be applied uh, very quickly. Um, so this is a, also open source component. It's interesting thing that actually this component is written in TypeScript and uh, it, it uh, can be used in the in JavaScript projects. Um, I will post a URL where you can find some of the interesting information. So. So from perspective of the features, I don't want to talk a lot about like what kind of features available and what can be done, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a website for that. There is a, a plenty of um, uh, the charts and the different features available, map, cache, um, integration with the listeners, entry processors. Entry processors are cool. So in this case, if you need to change some value, uh, you don't need to retrieve it, change it locally and put it back. So in this case, you can actually send a small, small task like a stored procedure in, in, your, uh, in your database that will change the value in place. Or you can do some, some, um, some more like custom logic. For example, you need to increase uh, salary for, for all your employees. So in this case, you don't need to go through the, or iterate through the all elements of this distributed map. You can send a small piece of computation that will be, it's basically just a, um, small small function that will be executed on the server side that will do it once and you don't need to move data around. 
Um, also, I, I wrote this uh, ref card. I don't know if you if you've seen those before, it's like some of, some of the things that you can actually print and have it on your desktop, or you can just simply you know, print and put it in the restroom in your work when they, your, uh, your colleagues will be you know, in the restroom. They will learn something rather than just checking the social network feeds. Um, and uh, the NPM package is, is, based, is there. Um, so if you're looking for some, some interesting caching solution to play around, I would suggest to use this. So a couple things about uh, about this demo. So what what I did this uh, this uh, CF Summit uh, 2017 Wednesday um, is 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 on GitHub. So it um, includes Java component that you will deploy uh, uh, that uses all configuration. Oh, I didn't show this cool part. So while I'm talking and taking some questions, I can actually um, show you how I can let me scale this. So now. Um, I almost forgot the most fun part. So now I have three nodes. I can go ahead and say CF update service uh, and after. That will increase my cluster by four nodes. Um, and uh, hopefully it will, uh, <laughs> it, it, it will be executed. Now, and the second link, uh, slides and the video will be posted there here. So you can go here. This is, by the way, right slide to take pictures. Um, if you have any questions, like I said, I'm always on Twitter and uh, ready to talk to anyone. Um, how many of you guys have a Twitter here? Okay, good, because sometimes people don't have a Twitter, this is why I have an email here. So for those people who don't have a Twitter, I have an email, and this is my, my website. So now I can take some questions and uh, talk about some of the use cases. Thank you for, uh, Thank you for, for, for this 30 minutes. Uh, so how is the synchronization done between the uh, nodes of the Hazard cast? I mean, okay. if, if it's, there is distance between, between uh, the nodes? Yep. So synchronization happened in the following way. So basically, Hazelcast require, uh, interact between nodes uh, through TCP. So uh, it, is, it is socket connection and nodes constantly chatting. So um, when I talk about the data distribution pattern, Hazelcast use similar concept called uh, consistent hashing. So basically, data stored in one place, and there would be some replicas of the data. I can actually, it's better to actually show it in, in management center. Um, in the management center, oh, it already started doing something. So in this case, I have a two, uh, two entries in this map, and one entry stored in one node, and another entry stored in another node. So using this uh, hashing algorithm, um, Hazelcast will place them in one node or another node, and also it will create a backup. So the, basically, the things when you're shutting down some nodes and restarting some other nodes, as you can see, even though I already uh, lost one node, now it node comes back, I, I'm not losing the data because, first of all, my data is partitioned, so data is distributed across uh, all nodes of the cluster, plus it has a, we call it backup count, but some people in their products are called replica count. The partition that holds particular data has a, has a backup. Um, we actually have very extensive documentation explaining how this process is done, um, and it's you know, far beyond on you know, five minutes of, uh, of uh, explaining. So, but the, uh, the most important thing here is that you don't, oh, now you see it. I'm running four nodes, it's scaled up, and uh, actually it happens without outage. So Hazelcast is designed to be a um, system that works in an environment where you're expecting some failures. So what we like to see in distributed systems, we cannot prevent failures, we just need to embrace them and uh, deal with the situation that we're, living, we, we, we're operating in a very um, uh, hostile environment, I would say. So this is why killing node or killing two nodes will not basically affect uh, to data about the distance. So usually, because it's TCP and uh, the, because it's uh, um, data consistency is, is, is important part, um, we 
recommend to deploy Hazelcast nodes close to each other, preferably local type of network. However, if you need to have a, a distributed system across multiple um, availability zones, it's possible. Uh, we not recommend to deploy Hazelcast across multiple regions because in this case, latency will affect the performance of the cluster and consistency of the data. Uh, for that purpose, we have a, the, the WAN replication or uh, basically it's called WAN replication. It allows you to synchronize cluster across multiple uh, regions. Okay, any other questions? One here. Uh, I have a quick question on the architecture of Hazelcast yeah. Grid. So in terms of CAP theorem, do you, are you like CA or CP? Okay, so the question was, um, how I can how I can tell about Hazelcast from perspective of CAP theorem? So it's actually a good question because it depends. It depends how you would, what kind of guarantees you want to have. So Hazelcast is very explicit and very configurable tool. For some cases, for some data structure, you can say, okay, I want to have strong consistency. In this case, you can assign things like you can use synchronous APIs that will provide you, you know, synchronous response. Um, or for some cases, you won't have availability. So in this case, you will decide about consistency after. So if your cluster will fall apart using split brain, uh, you can decide after if this data was modified in multiple places. Um, if you want to have a consistency, you can assign a quorum and saying that if cluster size will go down for less than like three nodes, so in this case, I will not accept any modifications, but I will be able to serve uh, reads. Um, in this case, my data will be consistent in a situation where cluster formation is not full and will maybe I will not be able to you know, hold all this data. So all these things are very relative to the CAP theorem because it's, it's a more like a theory. In, in practice, we allow you to control. As a developer, we can decide. And it's actually per data structure. You can say one cache, I don't care about consistency, I just care about availability. In another cache or another map, you can configure, say, no. For this one, I want to have a quorum. And in this case, I cannot go smaller than three nodes in my cluster. Now I have four nodes, right? Okay, last question. Uh, so I got a question on uh, the the feature you have on uh, the UI, the WAN replication or the WAN piece. So does the PCF or the Hazelcast style on PCF support WAN? Uh, so we, right now, it, it does support, but we don't have a running demo right now. But uh, my colleague, so the thing is right now with WAN is that you need to know explicit addresses to establish WAN connection. So what we're doing right now, and it's gonna be released in a couple of weeks, it's the uh, discovery in WAN. So you can use uh, any discovery service or you will be able to use also like a VCAP to pass this information to different data, uh, to different data centers or to different regions. So they will be able to uh, discover each other. So yes, uh, the tile itself supports, um, uh, but uh, we, we, we don't have like a demo that I can demonstrate this to you today. You can, you can uh, give me your, your contact if, I, if, I, if you need this demo, I will, I will be able to, to show it to you. Okay, we need to wrap up for the next speaker, but I'm sure if you'd like to talk to Victor. Yeah, I will I'll be handing out the round, so we'll, uh, let, let's, let's talk about it. Thank you guys. Thank you, Victor. Thanks for your time.